Today is our last meeting day. This is, today will be the end of this course. So we thank you for staying with us for the whole time. We hope we've uh, given you some useful stuff to take away with you. So a couple of uh, logistics things. So today is the last day of the course. Um, as you have hopefully noted, the course materials are available on the course website and they're pretty much up to date. So we have lecture slides for everybody up and the videos are catching up. We're up to about lecture 13 on the videos. This is lecture number 20 and the others will be along within the next week or two. So if you want to make up a class or re repeat and see what the speaker had to say on a particular day, the video is there for you to look at. For those of, uh, there's a few of you who might have missed the class and so it's easy to make up a class that you missed, just go look at the video and send uh, us, either myself or Christine, Christine's uh, the one outside the door, send her a note saying you've viewed the video and you've, you've completed that and she'll give you credit for it. So a little, little honor system here, but uh, we trust everybody. Probably trust you a lot more than some of the AI you've heard about, okay? The other thing is this, this course is, uh, has, has been a, an experiment for us. We wanted to make a lot of AI information available to you without your having to have a technical background in it. So we really appreciate your feedback on the CEF forms. So help us with future versions of this. Is there parts of this that you would rather us get rid of? Are there parts you'd like to see us cover in more depth? You know, how was the whole thing, how was your experience with this? Please give us feedback so that we can improve this for the next time around with the next group of students who are interested. There's 140 of you that registered, so that's a pretty good crowd. And there's a lot more on the campus who haven't registered yet, so spread the good word. So, <coughs> My purpose today is to give you a, my summary of the course, a little bit of emphasis on things I think we've, I've learned and I hope all of us have learned as we went along with this. So let me start out by re reviewing our objectives in this course. First thing, overall, we wanted to give you a picture of the dimensions of AI. It's a big field a lot of little pieces to it, but we want to give you a sense of what the whole field looks like and what are its primary dimensions. The three that we've emphasized the most as we've been talking here are a dimension that has to do with machine learning. We discussed a hierarchy of, of machines according to their learning power. Now that was at the beginning of the course. Then we talked about the implementation of artificial intelligence in key domains like vision and robotics and a number of others. And then finally, in the, in the final section, we talked about the strategy for, uh, implications for the military and the kind of risks that we have to be aware of if we're gonna use this technology. We also, <coughs> as we went along, took a look at the strengths and limitations of the different types of artificial intelligence that we talked about there's obvious strengths and there's also uh, our speakers emphasize certain things that are limitations we have to watch out for. Our goal is if we deploy any of this stuff is that it be reliable and dependable and that we all know how to use it responsibly. So that's also been a topic of, of discussion. Last week, we ended up with a big picture implications of all of this for the face of battle in the future. John Urquilla gave us that. I thought a lot of people found that very interesting and inspiring. And one of our other objectives is to help you see through the hype. This is a heavily hyped area. A lot of claims are made about artificial intelligence and we wanted you to be able to sort through them and see, oh yes, I know, this, 
you know, now I know what a neural network is, so if somebody's making claims about neural networks, I think I'm in a better position to understand whether their claim is believable or not. Let me give you my summary of fo focal points of hype. The overemphasis or the overclaiming gets concentrated in a few areas, so I just want to talk about these for a few minutes. First one of these hype statements is machines are intelligent. That's why we have the word artificial intelligent. It means that we have machines that are artificially made but are intelligent. So that's a point of hype as we've emphasized many times. None of the machines we've talked about is intelligent. The second one is uh, the promises of dramatic breakthroughs in all sorts of application areas. As you have seen from the speakers, what look like breakthroughs are actually achievements that have been achieved over a long period of time, 50 or more years of incremental improvements, dealing with some very hard problems, but making definite progress. But dramatic changes, by and large, no. Another, another one here is uh, we, we have this idea of machine learning. So we say, ah, this is wonderful. Those of you who've had to program in any of our courses probably hate programming. Those of you who've done programming before are always frustrated by how easy it is to make mistakes with programming. And so if somebody says, we can get rid of programming, the machine will learn by itself. That sounds like a good deal. Unfortunately, that's a lot of hype. It's not true that programming is dead. Long live programming. <laughs> Another one is big data enables AI. Well, it's certainly true there's a big chunk of AI, the neural network, that needs big data to train it. But there's an awful lot of other AI that's more conventional type programming. It's tough problems like speech recognition. A lot of robotics is like this. So there's a lot of pieces of AI that uh, have, have little to do with big data. And so we can't equate these two fields. Another one is uh, AI confers an unbeatable advantage. This is, seems to be in the background of a lot of people's concerns about AI and military use, is if we don't grab these advantages, we'll lose our superiority. And if somebody else grabs the advantages, they'll gain an advantage over us. So unbeatable, that's a questionable claim. Some of the advantages you get from AI are very tricky and mixed. So we'll come back to that one. Another related one here is the good far outweighs the bad. So we can think of a lot of good things AI can do. We can also think of a lot of ways to misuse it. But the good things on balance are better than the bad things. And I, uh, I think our, some of our speakers, especially our ethics speaker, Professor Strausser, makes us aware that uh, maybe some of the bad things need to be paid a lot of attention to. Let's, uh, let me take a look at some of these individual claims and just remind you of things we've said in the course as we went along on this. Let's, the first one is that AI machines are intelligent. So in order to understand the capabilities of AI machine, our first six lectures looked at the different types of AI machines that are already out there in use. So these are rule-based logic machines, somewhat conventional programming machines. They have database consisting of rules and facts and, and, uh, about the world, and they're trying to make inferences about the world based on the data that they have. Then there's supervised learning, which is the neural network, where we have uh, the network we have a training set which consists of inputs like photographs, a ton of photographs as inputs. And associated with each input is a label. So somebody has gone to the trouble before we ever talked to the machine and said, this photograph <coughs> means that. This is a picture of a cat. This is a picture of my mother. This is a picture of a dog. This is a picture of a tank. So somebody's done all of that already. And then we present all that to the neural network and it remembers everything. So that when you present it, 
the picture in the future, after it's been changed, it will give you the correct label for the picture. And then if you present another picture that hasn't been trained, we, we hope, and this is where there's a lot of uncertainty, we hope that the network will correctly label that too. So that's supervised learning. Well, one of the <coughs> some of our speakers told you that one of the big problems with supervised learning is it seems to require enormous data sets. And these enormous data sets are hard to get, they're expensive to get, they're unreliable. And so we, uh, we have motivation to see if we can find ways that machine can learn without having to be supervised by a training data set. That was unsupervised learning. The primary uh, achievements in that area have been with these games like chess and Go and some other ones which played against each other, you know, two, two chess playing machines playing against each other and learning how to play chess and then becoming better than the world's grandmaster. Same thing with Go and some other games. I guess it was recently done for poker. So we learned how to play games pretty well with unsupervised learning and we're now investigating whether we can have other kinds of learning that are, are successful and also unsupervised. We also talked about human machine teaming, which is the design of the machine and the interface to it so that humans and the machines can both contribute what they're best at. So humans are good with judgment and evaluation. Machines are good at high speed calculations. You put those two together in the right way, you can get some pretty amazing things. The final thing we talked about was aspirational machines. These, these are the future machines that people hope someday will be built, but we don't know whether we can build them. So Professor Rowe talked to you about a lot of those. The first batch in this thing here, I, when you look at them and you see how they work, Nobody wants to claim they're intelligent. They just say these are just obviously machines. They do very good things, but they're not intelligent. The aspirational machines are maybe, someday, maybe, somebody will come up with a, one of these aspirational machines that other people say is intelligent. So this remains to be seen. Researchers are looking at this question, but don't count on it for next week or next year. So that's, that's the state of what we know about what machines are capable of doing and that look like there could be intelligent actions, but they're not in really intelligent. They're at best simulations of that. The second area of hype has to do with the claim of dram dramatic breakthroughs in applications areas. So we talked about a whole bunch of applications areas, data science, which is the use of very large data sets uh, from which we might learn how to uh, cull out data that tells us things that are going on about the world or the community that got whose data this is that we couldn't see by ourselves. And we use these large data sets to train neural networks to do things for us. So this, is, this has been an important area, but this area has uh, been growing and growing over the years. In every era of computing that I've lived through, there's always big data. There's always more data than the machine that you have is available to process. And you're always wondering, how do we deal with the larger data sets? So that, this is not a new problem. This be, we've been making incremental process, progress with it for a long time. I suppose you might say what's new in recent years is we have powerful machines, the AI machines, the supercomputers that let us go through much larger data sets and learn much bigger things than we used to be able to do. So that's progress but not dramatic breakthrough. We also talked about management, the possibility that you could use artificial intelligence for various management things. So some of the areas where this has been used is looking through personnel records, helping us evaluate applications for employment, helping us uh, match people up with the best job assignments, making manpower projections, these kind of uh, calculation-oriented things. But on the other hand, there's a lot of other aspects of management, such as managing people, dealing with conflicts, doing the, the, the planning, figuring out what the markets are up to, et cetera, 
that human beings are much better at and will probably remain so in the future. So Professor Apte, who talked about that, uh, was very clear that the job of the manager is not likely to go away anytime soon. The tools that the manager has to do that job may change, but they're not going to get rid of the job of the manager. Another area we took a, a look at was the vision area. Professor uh, Kolsch came and talked to you about that area and talked to you about all the, the kinds of neural networks that have been developed and have done very well at being able to look at images and tell you what the images contain. What, what are they showing you pictures of? Very tremendous progress been made in the last decade on this, this topic. And part of that progress has come from increased power of supercomputers to power those vision networks as you try and train them. But this is, again, uh, not dramatic breakthrough, but a series of, of improvements that have happened over a long period of time. So if you compare the state of the world 30 years ago with the state of the world today in vision, you might say dramatic change. But on the other hand, nothing big is hanging around the corner about to make a breakthrough in this area. Cybersecurity is always a concern. Uh, what our speaker there, Britta Hale, told you was that the cybersecurity area has now has a much richer treasure trove of hard to impossible security problems to deal with, opened up by AI. And, and AI is, seems to have created more security problems than it has solved. So security experts have their hands full trying to worry about things like whether an AI system can be fooled by an adversary who presents noisy data to it and gets the system to malfunction. We talked about natural language, which is a very old concern of AI, being able to listen to speech or read the newspaper, or read a magazine, read a document, even create a document. So a lot of things going on with natural language. Some of them have been improved in recent years with the help of the large data sets. But a lot of them have just been a slow, steady slog of trying to do things, trying to learn how to do things that, uh, by machine that seem to be only in the, the realm of human beings talking to each other. You heard a lot about robotics from Professor Bingham. Uh, there, I think the main message was that the state of the art of robotics is that we need lots of data to train them. And uh, again, they come up with the same issue of where do you get reliable data to train the robotic systems with. He also emphasized the fact that there's large components of robotic systems that are not neural networks and need conventional type programming to solve them. Like, especially you mentioned the reward function when you have a robot that's learning to do things and you have, uh, give it rewards when it does a good thing and, and negative feedback when it gets a bad thing, that the reward function is programmed. It's not, not another neural network that's giving out a, a, a rewards. We talked, uh, Professor Strausser was here and talked to you about ethics, a lot of ethical issues involved in this. What's What's a misuse of AI? What's a good use of AI? None of these things has easy answers. And uh, he had a lot to say about that. So these are examples of area, application areas of artificial intelligence that have made definite progress. A lot of it's been incremental, but it's not likely you're going to see a dramatic breakthrough in any one of them in the, in the immediate future. You'll see continued big progress. You'll see more and more powerful computers enabling these areas to do bigger things. Another one here is the idea that now that we have machines that can learn, programming is dead. Thank goodness those of us that have to learn programming don't have to. That's wrong. Programming is not going to go away. So all you computer science students who are hoping that next year a robot will do your programming, sorry. We can't help you with that. So <clears throat> when we talk about implementing a practical AI system, it's like 
It's the same kind of considerations we have to talk about when we're talking about implementing any software system or any combination of software or hardware like a robot. So this is an engineering problem. It's not just an artificial intelligence problem. So then when we go about trying to do these kind of systems, we traditionally know that there's, there's a couple of ways we can do it. One of them is the, what you might call the traditional way of doing it, which is to design and program algorithms. So we might call that traditional programming, traditional algorithm design. The second thing we've learned from machine learning is we could teach the machine how to do something by showing it numerous examples. So that's called machine learning. The first one you might call traditional programming. The second one you might call machine learning. And then we have uh, kind of a new aspect that's come up during some of these trainings of these machines and unsupervised learning is the reinforcement idea where when a machine does the right thing, you give it a reward so it will do more of the right thing. When it does the wrong thing, you give it a negative reward so it does less of the wrong thing. And we do this with simulations. So we put the machine into a simulated environment. We show it what's the good things by giving it rewards. We show it what's the bad things by giving it negatives. And so the machine can learn by reinforcement simulations. So we have kind of three basic approaches that we can use here. And the bottom line of it is that to do the engineering of these artificial intelligence systems, we have to do all three of these things. So we can't get rid of software engineering. We've got to still do that. We can't get rid of good robotics, you know, gears and levers, electronics engineering. And we, we need to understand better how to do the simulations and modeling so we can help uh, build these things better. <clears throat> Another area of uh, hype has been the area that says big data is the powerhouse that's driving AI. And it's true that big data has gotten big. It's true that a lot of really amazing things have been done with big data. But it's not true that big data is driving artificial intelligence. They kind of, it's more like a synergistic relationship. So big data enables the neural network to do something useful, and the neural network provides the means for big data to be useful, okay? So the very synergetic relationship there. But this is not the only thing that goes on with this. If you look, as we said, if you go look a little deeper at big data and the training that goes on with neural networks, you see that the data sets that are required to do some of the amazing things we want are actually quite huge. So it's not unusual to say, well, in order to do some application to train my neural network, I need 100 million labeled images. They need to show it 100 million pictures of things and tell them, you know, they've been labeled, what does this picture mean? And the neural network is supposed to learn all of that, remember it, and be able to you show it a picture in the future and be able to come back and say, here's what this means. Well, you, to do this well, you might need 100 million of these. And so the question is, where do you get 100 million labeled photographs, properly labeled photographs? And that's not very clear. So it's very expensive to obtain this kind of data. And it turns out that uh, to get in large quantity, uh, some of it is acquired by dubious means. So we're not sure about the quality of the data. We, have, we might come up with 100 million photographs that we think are properly labeled, but it turns out they're not properly labeled. And uh, another thing that we don't talk about very much is this training process is energy intensive. Today we've been extremely worried about <coughs> increasing amounts of energy being used by computation. We want to make sure that we really want to pay for it. A famous thing that gets talked about a lot with energy use and computation is Bitcoin mining. How many of you know Bitcoin? So you know that in order to produce a new Bitcoin, you have to solve what they call a computationally hard problem. And it's set up so that it with the world's fastest supercomputers, it, it might take uh, about 10 minutes to produce one new Bitcoin. 
that doesn't seem a lot, but 10 minutes of a supercomputer computation, which where the supercomputer consists of uh, 10,000 chips arrayed out in some big array, those things can use up <coughs> as much energy as a whole power generating plant can put out just to get one Bitcoin. And I saw some uh, figures from the economists were suggesting that Bitcoin mining was running two or three percent of the world's electricity cost. A lot of Bitcoin mining was being done in the black market, by the way. So, uh, <coughs> but neural networks use a similar kind of setup to train them. They've got a large amount of uh, chips going to in parallel. They call them graphics processing chips because the same chips are used to drive the, the high-speed graphics on your uh, screens. Uh, so you've got tens of thousands of these chips running in parallel. They use up a lot of energy. So this turns out to be very energy intensive. And I think that as this goes along, there's going to be more and more people asking whether we really want to pay the energy costs for some of these things. <clears throat> Bottom line of all of this is that even though we have this notion of training and the machine learning, there's an awful lot of AI that you might just call programmed AI. P professional programmers got to do it. So big data is synergetic, but it's not the driver, and neither is AI the driver. They kind of they coexist and they help each other, but they don't, they're not the reason the other one exists. <clears throat> Another hype statement is this one, that the AI confers unbeatable advantages. One, of, one clear advantage is speed. There's a lot of tasks you can do at very high speed with artificial intelligence. It's also low cost of entry. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to do these things. But at the same time, it's low cost for us. It's also low cost for the adversary. And this is upsetting the uh, balance of power because adversaries can now have access to artificial intelligence tools that it used to be only we had access to. It's very easy to misuse artificial intelligence. There's new, more, more and more examples being cited in the press of possible ways to misuse artificial intelligence. Comes up all the time in the ethics discussions like is this use of artificial intelligence ethical or not? Etc. So this is, this is an area that's not only possible to do, do great things with, it's also possible to do great harm in this area. <clears throat> it's a very difficult technology to regulate, so even if you say we need some regulation to make sure that it stays useful and that we minimize risks of misuse, really hard to enforce that kind of regulation. So this is one of these technologies that's growing and growing and uh, expanding, expanding, but nobody really knows how to regulate it. We also have heard a lot on this topic, adversarial attacks, the possibility that an adversary can attack an AI system by doing something, things that look simple, like you show, we saw the example of the stop sign that had to be recognized by a driverless car and somebody put little bits of masking tape at a few spots on the top the stop sign and the circuits, the, the neural network that recognizes road signs thought it was a speed limit sign, not a stop sign. You would certainly not want that to be part of the controller of your driverless car. So that is an example of somebody purposely trying to confuse the artificial intelligence by a small amount of noise, a few splotches on a stop sign that most human beings would never say is Say the city workers ought to come and clean up the stop sign. There's bird droppings on it. But the aid of artificial intelligence can't tell that it's bird dropping. It thinks it's somehow the neural net thinks it's a speed limit sign. So this not only creates a problem for the users, but it also creates an opportunity for adversaries to try and confuse the artificial intelligence by throwing random noise at it or even better what looks like random noise to us, but is actually cleverly designed random noise to confuse the, the machine. Another one here, which again, gets a lot of controversial answers. It's no, most of these are not things that we have answers to, but 
uh, more good than evil. Well, you know, some people say uh, the worst evil you can think of is Skynet, the Hollywood Terminator idea. But that's just Hollywood making up stories, but the real world isn't that bad. But on the other hand, a lot of people are pointing out bad things that can happen with artificial intelligence that don't need a hypothetical Skynet to make them bad. So one of the, one of the questions is, is uh, adversarial attacks, a heavily researched area, going to get so good at being an adversary that it renders the AI useless? Because you know, we have terrific AI, but the enemy knows how to jam it. They have terrific AI, we know how to jam theirs, so nobody can use their AI. Is that, is that, nobody knows the answer to that question, but it is a, uh, an important question. Another one, some of you might have seen this, there's a famous video, you can find it on Google if you haven't already found it. Just type in the word slaughterbots to, and you'll find a YouTube video by a, produced by a Berkeley professor named Stuart Russell who's written a book on this, if you like reading books. But uh, slaughterbots are small drones, easily fit in the hand, that are able to fly around in small spaces, recognize faces, target a particular individual or a particular class of individual, and then drop a little bomb on them and kill them. So you can uh, assassinate political op opponents with these things or you could have swarms of them that could do a lot of damage to a classroom or a meeting or something like this. So uh, this is easily within the current state of the art. Probably the ability to do this is no more than two or three years away. Now that somebody has a video saying, look at this, uh, the threat from this, weapons of mass destruction produced with cheap, hold them in your hand drones. Swarms of these things become a weapon of mass destruction. If you haven't seen that video, I strongly recommend that you do. It's about an eight minute video, it really conveys the message of how vulnerable we are to this kind of misuse. The question I always have is, you know, we talk about all the good things that AI can do for us, but we, we sometimes forget that we live in bureaucratic systems with lots of rules. We often complain about the rules. Normally when we get up against a rule that we don't like, we go talk to somebody in authority and get a waiver. With AI, there's nobody to talk to, it's just the machine. So you can wind up at the rules running the show. A lot of people worry about this. So we can, I call that artificial stupi stupidity. So the stupidity of mindless rules takes over and the, the intelligent part gets lost. That's another concern. So there's lots of concerns of this type that cast doubt on the question of whether there's an unbeatable exam, uh, advantage or whether we actually do more good than evil. And again, I don't have answers <coughs> to these, but I know there's a lot of people talking about it. There's a very interesting article which appeared in the uh, July issue recently uh, by Commander Brent Stil Spilner which he called bedrock principles of AI implementation. And he's reminding us basically that we're building engineered systems that are supposed to be used in war battle operations. And we have the you know, common standards that we have within the military that we need to imply that so we get systems that can be considered reliable and safe for their users. So he he says that the uh, implementations in the field must be reliable and dependable, safe and secure, and he gives four general guidelines which sound here uh, like they're so general you don't know quite what they mean, but uh, you know, frame realistic expectations, in other words, don't let the hype eat you up, always keep people in the loop, don't expect the machines to be wiser than people, always have somebody around who can overrule the machine if necessary or guide the machine. Keep the roles and limitations clear, but he just simply means understand what the machine is good at, understand what the human is good at, and don't try and mix them up. 
And finally, design and test to objective standards. This is what we do a lot of military systems. We, have, we know, you know it's got to pass certain tests, and we insist that it does pass the, the tests and their objective tests. The same should be true for AI systems. So this is, this is a, uh, not a long article, but is well worth the read to see somebody ask us to keep our feet on the ground, even though our minds are floating in the clouds, dreaming of all these wonderful things AI can do for us. Along the way, uh, we have uncovered a number of dilemmas in artificial intelligence. I just want to list a bunch of them. There's actually quite a few here just so you know that there's a lot of unsolved issues floating around. One of them is, we mentioned the fragility issue, which is the issue with neural nets where you change the input by a, just a tiny bit, so, so small that a human doesn't think anything changed at all, but the machine thinks something is radically different and gives you a radically different output. So we call that fragile because our intuition is thinking that a small change of input will produce a small change of output, but the reality is that's not true. And we don't know how to control that right. There's a lot of research going on trying to figure that out. Another one is intelligibility. Uh, neural network says, here's a decision for you. And you say, well, how did you reach that conclusion? And you can't answer the question. And nobody can answer the question because if you open the black box, all you see is this giant gigabit size connection matrix linking up all the nodes with connection weights and you have no idea, nobody has any idea what they mean. So it's unintelligible, we can't answer the question. So a lot of people looking at the question, is it possible to augment neural networks with other types of checks and balances that allow us to be able to explain what the thing did and why it did it? And more importantly, if you don't like what it did, can you correct it? Another issue is bias. Uh, we've had numerous issues of people training a neural network and then you take it into the field and it's giving you answers that are obviously racially biased or so biased in some other way. And you, it has to do with the selection of the training data, but nobody noticed it during training. They thought their data was fair and balanced, passed all statistical tests for being fair and balanced. But when you train the network, that fragility problem comes in and small statistical variations show up as big differences in the results. So again, people are extremely worried about that. Nobody knows quite exactly how to prevent it. Another one we mentioned is the cost of getting reliable data to train the network. It's very expensive to get highly reliable data. Another one is military uses of AI, uh, you know, national strategies has been to try and get cooperation of industry, cooperation of the uh, universities to help out with the national defense. And you discover there's a lot of faculty in the universities and their graduates who have become employed in companies now objecting to their university or their company doing something that has a military use, just on some, some general principles. And so, this in interferes with the cooperation that's needed between the industry and the academic and the, and the uh, defense department. So nobody has a good answer for that one, but it is a consideration. Another one is with weapons and control, uh, the, you know, the question of the human in the loop. If we have an automatic control system for a weapon, uh, and you, is it possible that these, the thing goes so fast that it would start a war that no human wanted to start? So how do you, how do you deal with that? Going a little bit beyond the immediate Defense Department thing, there's this ever-present discussion about jobs and employment going on, about whether artificial intelligence is going to replace workers faster than new jobs are generated. <laughs> Nobody has an answer for that one, but it's a big topic of discussion. Uh, another dilemma is in surveillance. Your personal data is being collected by apps. When you, when you use any app like Google search, data about you is being collected and is then being sold to advertisers. And you don't have any control over that. A lot of people are concerned about that, want to rein it in. Decision making, again, 
the same thing, the same kind of problem as with weapons and control. You're asking an artificial intelligence system to make a decision or a recommendation for a decision, but yet we don't know whether it's trustworthy. And how do we, how do we know when these automatic systems give us trustworthy recommendations? Deep fakes is another one. AI tools are being now used to manufacture our, uh, photographs, images, sounds, and other things that look like they came from an actual person. So you can make it look like uh, somebody did was, was doing something they never actually did, but it's very hard to detect the fake because of the extremely high quality of the fake. So this is undermining a lot of systems that we use for, for identity checks. Is how do we know that somebody that's uh, presumed to be doing something is actually the person doing it? So there's a lot of interest in trying to figure that one out. And then there's a last one here is a question of speed and resilience. When we talk about adversaries like Russia and China, in those countries, the uh, industry and the universities do what the government tells them to do. So it gives them the appearance of being able to move very quickly. In the US, we don't have the ability to tell industry and academia what to do. We do have, we do encourage them. We need cooperation for it to work. The uh, effect of that is we get more resiliency. If, if, if the, the other country speeds into a direction that turns out to be a dead end, we won't get locked into the dead end. They might get locked, but we don't. But you know, how do you t tell when their speed is better than your resiliency or vice versa? Nobody has the answer to that one either. So these, this whole field has opened up a whole bunch of new dilemmas that are in the background of many discussions and we don't have good answers for them, but they'll continue to be in the background. People will continue to discuss them and you'll probably get involved in those discussions yourself. So uh, it's bas basically up to us, the human operators, to find the solutions. The machines are not going to find solutions to these problems. I'll just, we're now at the end of the course, so I want to leave you with a, a, a general thought of my own thought here is that that this technology, this artificial intelligence technology that we've been discussing this whole quarter is a fascinating technology. You've all come here and you've spent your lunch hours for the last 10 weeks with us. And most of you have uh, stayed here for the whole time. So that's very hard. It makes us feel good that, that we have good subjects for you to chew over while you, while you eat. But at the same time, is it, is a, it's, it's clever technology, it's ingenious technology, and at the same time, it's fascinating technology. And there's a danger in the fascination that we need to be vigilant about. The fascination with the technology creates a distance. The people that we're trying to interact with and with the technology wind up being pixels on a screen, and they're not real anymore, they're some sort of Re, uh, simulation or image on a screen. There's a distance there. There's also a distance uh, as we're trying to carry out war operations. All we see is what we see on the screen and sometimes that might look like nothing more than a video game that we're playing. The horrors of war are somewhere in a very great distance, distance and we don't get to experience them. Also the this kind of distance of being fascinated with the technology undermines our ability to respect other people because we don't see them. It increases our own fears, our own distrust, our own resentment, our own anxieties. So I ask you as you go forward, the learning you've, you've gotten in this course to be vigilant, to not get trapped in technology fascination. Always keep in mind that we're trying to use this technology to do our jobs better, to interact better with other people. And when we do so, let us do it in a way with our tools that treats them with respect and dignity and understanding. So this is the end of our course. I uh, thank you very much for participating with us this quarter. And please take this learning and put it to good use. 
And please give us your feedback so that the next time we do this, we'll do an even better job. So thank you very much.